Hey, I'm Darcy. This time we're not looking at a particular species, but rather a relationship. The relationship between plants, and to put it delicately, their little helpers. You see, plants can't move, which makes reproduction rather awkward. Us humans take it for granted that when we want to engage in consenting copulation, we only need walk, roll, or slither over to another person. It's hard to root when you've got roots. The goal of angiosperms, that is flowering plants, is to get their pollen transported from the anther of their flower to the stigma of another plant's flower. It doesn't matter how it gets there, all that matters is it does. So they rely on a number of animal species for reproductive redistribution. For this reason, scientists have dubbed these animals their flying genitals. Imagine requesting an Uber driver to deliver your ejaculate to your partner's house. You may call that an OHS disaster in the making, but this is modus operandi in the plant world. Flowers are designed to encourage our coital couriers with a number of incentives. Their beautiful colours and shapes, the intoxicating aroma, nectar, the sweet opium that keeps the ecosystem alive, and the pollen itself. It's a good source of protein. There are countless varieties of native flowers, but let's cover the big ones. Eucalyptus, tea trees, wattles, banksias, waratahs, grevilleas, cambra bells, kangaroo paws, pig face, billy buttons, lily pillies, and bottle brushes. Planting natives is always a good idea. They use less water and attract many of the species we'll be looking at today. It's a win-win. And an extra win for me as I fool a bunch of sweaty gamers into watching Gardening Australia. Without any further ado, let's meet our pollinators. Let's start with the poster girls. Ladies do all the work around here. Bees are very effective pollinators. They're covered in millions of hairs that create a positive electric charge to accumulate plant powder. Not that kind. Some bees even have hairs on their eyes. I don't know what that phobia is called, but now you have it. You're welcome. You're probably very familiar with these bees, the European honeybee, which were introduced to Australia nearly 200 years ago. Although they're an invasive species, they do play an important role pollinating plants and crops. A bit like if someone broke into your house, but did the dishes and folded all your laundry. But they aren't the only bees in town. There are over 2,000 species of native Aussie bees which deserve much more recognition. Most of the native species are non-social, meaning they don't form hives and prefer a night at home alone in the nest. Can relate. Notable examples are the masked bees, the stingless bees, the leaf cutter bees, the blue banded bees, and the teddy bear bees. Another darling of the insect world, there are over 400 species of butterfly in Australia. As more evolved beings than us, they suck their nutrients through a proboscis, eliminating the need to chew. Butterflies have a penchant for the nectar of wattles, tea trees, bottle brushes, lavender, and daisies, if you're looking to give them a helping hand. They're less efficient pollinators than bees, but visit flowers more frequently. Both they and their Mardi Gras worm offspring provide an important food source for many other animals. There's 11,000 moth species in Australia, compared to the measly 400 butterflies. Moths aren't well known as pollinators, because they prefer to get down to business with the lights off. Their hairy dad bods are most suitable for the task of floral IVF. Most notable are the hawk moths, who have a special relationship with some plants. Said plants prefer the well-endowed proboscises of these moths, and have evolved long flowers that only the hawk moth can access, leaving the other plebs, I mean valued pollinators, out of the game. Now it wouldn't be a backyard naturalist video without mentioning our favourite little dinosaurs. The notable avian pollinators in Australia are the birds of the honey eater family. Waddle birds, miners, spinebills, friar birds, and chats. Oh, how was your weekend, hey? Oh, nice, nice, nice. There are also some nectar-eating parrots, lorikeets of course, and the critically endangered swift parrot. Some flowers prefer birds to visit them, and have a scent that deters insects while attracting our feathered friends. Bird pollination has a couple of advantages. Birds will not die off or hibernate during the colder months like many insects do, and their long distance flight ensures that plant species can propagate much further afield. The aforementioned swift parrot is known to migrate from the mainland to Tassie to breed, and in the process they pollinate some of the eucalyptus species there. 
blowflies. Yes, you heard that right. They're actually very good pollinators. A species of blowfly in Western Australia has been found to be as effective as a honeybee. Flies are also responsible for providing us with avocados, coffee and mangoes, as they propagate those crops more than any other insect. Never thought you'd be appreciating flies, now did you? Even the dreaded March fly pulls its weight. But even still, get f***ed. But there is one type of fly that I'd really like to focus on. What if I told you flies could be bees? You probably wouldn't want me babysitting your small children. Let me introduce you to the hoverfly. Truly an underappreciated insect, the hoverfly performs many of the duties of bees, even styling themselves in that striking black and yellow uniform. They only have a single set of wings, unlike bees who have two sets, but they've traded them out for these sick gyroscopes called halteries that let them hover in place. Not only do hover chads distribute pollen, their larvae also eat aphids. These flies definitely need some more love. Oh. Mosquitoes are fertilizing flowers when they're not giving you an intravenous suck job. That joke was terrible, but even low-hanging fruit need to be pollinated. The primary food source for most mosquitoes is actually nectar rather than blood. In the blood sipping species, it's only the females that do it when they're gearing up to lay eggs. Males don't bite at all. There are even some species of orchids that rely completely on the mosquito to pollinate them. <laughs> Flying foxes are commonly seen taking off at dusk to forage for food. They will eat fruit from a range of plant species, particularly figs, and for this reason they're often called the fruit bat. But fruit isn't their preferred cuisine. It's actually nectar and pollen from native trees, especially gums. Flying foxes have large wings made of skin, the same skin as the webbing between your fingers. Ugh. They can travel up to 50 kilometers a night, making them excellent long distance pollinators of our forests. It's just a who's who of your least favourite insects, huh? Some wasps are very helpful, even those horrible yellow jackets. And no, a wasp didn't write this script, that would be crazy. <laughs> a notable native wasp is the blue flower wasp. Now before you say nuke it from orbit, it's the only way to be sure, let me put you at ease. These girls are not aggressive towards people, and are a gardener's best friend, as they pollinate our flowers, so just relax. They also turn beetle larvae into a dual purpose living nursery and pantry in a scene that makes Alien look like an episode of Bluey. So there's that. The relationship between some species of figs and wasps is particularly interesting. They've become completely dependent on each other to reproduce. Female fig wasps will mate with a male wasp inside a fig, coating herself in pollen during the bonk sesh. Then she'll fly to another fig, burrow inside and lay her eggs in there while pollinating it. When the larvae hatch, they'll eat their way out, except for the males, who spend their whole lives inside the fruit waiting to get f***ed and dying shortly after. What a life. Don't worry about eating dead wasps though, the fig has an enzyme that breaks down their carcasses. Beetles are the hipster pollinators. They've been pollinating conifers and cycads before flowers even existed. The most famous beetle pollinator is the ladybird, which not only distributes pollen, but keeps the aphids where they belong. Hell. Plague soldier beetles are infamous for moving in hordes of over a thousand as they fertilize flowers and each other. Ants are more well known for their seed dispersal, but they do occasionally take on pollen. They kind of suck as pollinators, honestly. Ants have something called a metapleural gland that secretes antimicrobial fluid on their bodies to prevent bacteria and mold growth. Your body doesn't secrete disinfectant, you jealous? Anyway, this unfortunately destroys any pollen that they've collected. But the wavy leaved smoke bush of Western Australia has miraculously adapted to this setback. Its pollen has become impervious to the ant's bioweapon. The most common possums in our backyards are of course the ringtails and the brush tails. Though these boys have a penchant for nectar, they'll just as easily eat the flower whole, denying any other animal a chance to pollinate it. A possum with an important role to play is the null banger, or the honey possum. Check out the snooty on this cutie patootie. These long nosed fellas are one of the only marsupials that feeds entirely on nectar and pollen. They have an elongated tongue covered in hairs to scrape it out. This diet has a twofold effect. One, their teeth have almost disappeared, saving them thousands on dentist bills. And two, the Nullbanger is reliant entirely on the diverse and beautiful flowers that dot the coast of WA, making their diet a precarious one. 
There are also some non-animal pollination methods as well. Water. Air. And some plants prefer to go F themselves. Literally. They pollinate their own flowers. Pollination is important. Flowering plants make up 80% of all flora on Earth, including all of our crops and most of the world's natural ecosystems. If this process stops, oh yeah, we're kind of boned, hey. You'll have noticed that most of our pollinators are insects, and their populations are declining rapidly, worldwide. It's estimated that in just 30 years, we'll have lost 30% of all insects on Earth. There's a smorgasbord of factors contributing to this. Agricultural pesticides, habitat destruction, air and light pollution, and of course, climate change. It's not a stretch to say that this would be devastating, as insects not only pollinate, but also make up the base of most of the world's food chains. But there are a range of things we can do to help our arthropod amigos. Build an insect hotel. Plant native flowers local to your area. Keep external lights off at night. Avoid products made with pesticides. Let your lawn grow out. Or better yet, replace it with a garden. If we all put in the effort, our combined backyards could become the single biggest insect ecosystem in the world. I really enjoyed making this video. I learned a lot about a group of animals that I'd never really taken notice of. And that's what's so magical about the natural world. If you stop to look at a flower, you just never know what you're gonna find.